Yeah. Well, welcome everybody um, to our fourth IC37 webinar. Um, glad you're here to join us. Um, unfortunately, um, class president Phil Lotz won't be with us tonight. He had another commitment that came up at the last minute. So he asked um, me, I'm fortunate to be your um, class coach, Greg Fisher, and he asked me to share his regards and some of his latest news, which is, which is in, um, encouraging for sure. So there are regattas that are planned right now, as you can see. I won't read them to you, but you can see the New York Yacht Club Annual Regatta, Race Week, the Nationals, um, and that's great news. The charters, if we have some of those on the call tonight here, will be contacted this week, and they're hoping that you guys are still enthused to join in with us at all as well, and they're trying to make that happen. One thing that's important to know, there will be waivers signed and the Rhode Island state guidelines are going to be followed, and that's, that's important. That includes the 14-day quarantine and you know, all the face masks and the, the involvement around the 29 states that are 5% testing rate or higher that we certainly are a part of here in South Carolina. But um, hopefully this will open up even a little more as we get closer. And then Phil has also posted the uh, fall regatta schedule in Fort Lauderdale which is encouraging, and um, you can see the dates, November, January, and March. And Phil also said that they are looking forward to the California series, and there are a lot of discussion, uh, a lot of discussion and plans about that, so stand by. And um, I know Diana is on the call, and she's about to send uh, a notice out about that, and I think it's already posted on the web. So good stuff coming. Stand by. And the next thing we want to do is thank the people that helped make this happen. Um, North Sales with Laura has been on every one of our Zoom calls and got on here early with us tonight to help us prepare. And thank you, Laura, for your support. Um, a lot of the videos and photos that we use are courtesy of Mike, who's one of our speakers, as you know, Ed Adams, and of course, Melgus Boats and Morgan Kinney also help us with editing and video and a lot of the pictures that we're going to look at tonight. So we have um, two great presenters again. Um, <clears throat> for those of you that weren't with us last time, I'm going to introduce them again because they are um, not only super talented people, they're great guys, and obviously they're very enthusiastic to share what they know. And um, you'll see as you go along, they're open to questions, they're, they're humble, and uh, I think we'll learn a lot. But Ben Kenny is um, going to talk to us about his um, trimming. On, he trims a main, and um, is, he grew up in the Midwest, sailed out of Milwaukee Yacht Club. He was captain of his college team at University of Pennsylvania, and he's also been captain and chair of the Newark Yacht Club team race program and was on the winning Morgan Cup team at least six times. That's a big deal. <laughs> he sailed a bunch of different one designs with focus on the Etchells this past 10 years, where he's finished, finished in the top five in the world's twice and was Corinthian world champion twice. Last year, he formed this IC37 members only syndicate with Jay Cross and Hannah Sweat. And as we all know, they won the class's first national championship. Ben lives in Manhattan with his wife and two kids and is a managing director at J.P. Morgan's Corporate Investment Bank. And as we said last time, Ben is clearly a very busy boy. So we really do appreciate your time with us, Ben. This is great. Thanks, Rick. And Mike Marshall grew up on Narragansett Bay, went through all the ranks of the Optimus Laser 420, like the hot sailors do that come out of there. Mike, too, is captain of his college team at Conn College, one of the best schools around. He's a champion one design sailor, a number of classes. He's won the NAs in the J22 um, and the VX1 and as a J22 world champ. One thing that's special about Mike that I think is quite cool is that he's on the board of directors of the Canicut Island Sailing Foundation, which helps youth sailors enjoy the sport. Pretty cool. Mike is the lead sail designer for North Sails One Design. And just for knowing, He's the man behind the designs for all the IC37 sales. So we're really lucky to have him on with us. Um, so the next slide, Mike, we're approaching our final two webinars where once again, Ben and Mike have been fortunate enough, or we're fortunate enough, Ben and Mike offer to help us 
with these last two. Tonight we're going to discuss medium breeze sailing and the final one on July 23rd will be an overpowered upwind sailing. Tonight they're going to focus on the medium breeze 11 to 14, describe their ideal setup and the communication loop on the boat to ensure they're in that proper setup. Um, one thing I just want to mention, Ben has had some challenges with his internet, so if we lose him um, for a little bit, Mike and I will fake it, and certainly Ben will come back on and be a part of it. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll hope that that doesn't happen. But we're going to have the chat room open here after a little bit, and please don't hesitate to put your questions in there. Um, I'll moderate that and interrupt Mike and Ben every once in a while, and we have a great question from you all that we want to ask them. So with that, we'll let Mike take it away and introduce the talk. And thanks again, Mike and Ben, for doing this for us. This is great. Yeah, thanks, Greg, for uh, you know for all that. It's uh, it's super great to be here and um, and great to join and do our second one of these. And and uh, you know it's kind of funny for those of us who were for those who were on it uh, last time kind of seen this slide before, but, uh, but with the pictures in a little different direction. And that's because, you know, when we were kind of looking at the organization for this, we sort of came to the conclusion that the boat really has three ranges. It has the underpowered range, which is a zero to 11 knots. It has the powered range, which is sort of 11 to 14. And it has this overpowered range, which is, you know, in that 14 to 18 knots. And you know, really, if we remember last night or last uh, three weeks ago, the previous webinar, you know, our focus was on, you know, really in the light air was on moving the crew rate around and trying to achieve heel angle and just making sure that the, you know, our, our leeches of our sail were accurate and the boat was going as fast as it could. And they, so our, our priorities were kind of in that order. Um, but tonight in the powered up case in the, you know, in that powered up range, our priorities kind of shift. We've already got the crew out on the rail hiking and, and we're sort of getting to achieving our, the heel angle that we're looking to, that we're looking to achieve that, that 19 degrees of heel, 18, 19 degrees of heel, something like that. And, you know, and, 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 and we're probably most of the way there, we're just starting to depower our sails, you know, everything's powered up and going. And so really the priorities shift from this initial this initial weight movement they shift to more of a focus on making sure that the sails are trimmed properly and you know they're starting to flatten out the sails to really accelerate the boat and and there's this focus of this general boat setup speed which is sort of 7.5 7.6 knots and if you're if you're not going that speed then you're you know you're really you, you're probably losing to the boats around you so so we'll start, you know, start here, Ben, and, and maybe give us just a general setup on on how you're going to be thinking about the boat in this condition, tuning, crew weight. Just give us the, the the overview on what you're looking at, and then we can dive into the detail. Yeah, sure. So um, the you know, even though I spend majority of my brain power thinking about the main setup, you know, in these conditions when we're sailing out, the very first thing we we, we spend time working on is is the jib. Um, making sure we've got the jib set up correctly and then setting up the main from there. And, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the, how they inter, inter, how they work together and interplay a bit as we go through this. But, you know, the reality is, you know, if, if we think about sort of the, that last webinar, we're talking about a jib where your leads are all the way in, you are, you've got scallops in the, in the front of the jib We're you know, we are, um, we're not set up exactly there to start with uh, with the jib in, in these conditions. So we're probably still in the, the tightest hole um, in our leads, but we've got a fairly, uh, I wouldn't say firm head, uh, firm halyard, but we, we don't have, those scallops are gone. Um, we've taken those speed wrinkles out. Um, we're starting at either the, the most inside hole on our leads or maybe slightly um, one hole one hole out. Um, and we're, we're looking for, um, you know, fairly, uh, uh, a fairly fine entry on the, on the jib and, and making sure that we're not, um, you know, we've got a head stay that's not um, that's that's not bouncing all over the place. And one of the things that we'll talk a lot about, I think, over the next hour is sort of how we think about our head stay and head stay tension um, in these conditions, and how it, it, it it's different versus uh, versus the, the real light air. Um, once we have the jib kind of in the, the place where we we're, we're broadly looking for, um, we then then move on to the main, and um, you know. 
in these conditions, again, we've got everybody up on the rail. Uh, I may be setting up the main at center line or slightly above center line of the traveler. Um, our halyards relatively firm. Our outhaul, which we'll talk a bit about as we as, as, the, as the webinar goes on as well, that's relatively tight as well. Um, it's not, you know, it's not oh so tight that when you look at it, you say, "Well, I've got a strapped foot." Um, but we we're not looking for power in the you know in the foot of our sail uh, in these conditions uh, at this point. Um, the upper telltale of the jib is probably flying roughly ninety percent of the time, and the upper telltale of the main. Um, or the, the telltale off the top draft stripe, the, the telltale off of the uh, off of the, the 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 batten that goes into the fat head is you know doesn't really give you a whole heck of a lot. So I'm really trimming off of the telltale um, off the top draft stripe. That's flowing you know 90 90 percent of the time as well. Um, I find that, that that you can shut that down, but you really have to work hard to shut it down. Um, the way that the main and jib you know interplay. You know, it's really, you know, Hannah and I talked about this. Hannah was hoping to join us, then unfortunately she can't. Um, you know, but she is thinking about setting up her jib so that she's not affecting the main. Um, the second she starts to, we have any backwind in the main that's driven by the jib, not by, um, by my trim or by the driver, she goes one hole out in the jib. Um, but that's really how she's thinking about setting that up. And I think it's, it's very easy to try to set up, you know, with a traveler in your main that's a bit too high. Um, and, and 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 use that as your pointing mechanism in these conditions. I I, I think that you know if we're if we're more than one setting above our center line, um, there's got to be a pretty good reason for that um, in the moment. Okay. How about uh, global global tuning? Just as an overview on this, uh, you know, in this condition, where would you be on the on the runners and the bricks? Yeah. So that's the logical next question. Um, uh, Let's say we're, we're setting up without any bricks in, um, in, you know, in 11 to 14, you probably do need some bricks. Let's be, let's be frank. Um, if we have, if we start with say seven mils of brick underneath the, uh, underneath the rig, we're then trying to figure out if you need to go up and down from there based on how much backstay we have. And so the backstay um, is going to have a big impact on our headstay tension and on the shape of the main. Um, and if we're in, uh, if we're at say seven mils of brick and we are over backstaying very quickly. So if I, so we have, we have nine setting, we have a, we have tapes in the, in the back, in the, in the back of the boat um, with nine marks on them. Um, and I'm working with our, 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 our runner trimmer to sort of work through the cycles of where we want to be with those. Um, one being the least amount of runner, nine being the most amount of runner. Um, and if we find that if I'm trying to set my main up and not tilt, you know, I want to keep the boat at a relatively constant angle of heel, um, call it in the 19 to 22 to 23 degree angle, uh, degree angle of heel. Um, if we are constantly in the sort of the eight to nine or seven to nine range on the runner, um, and we're starting to overbend the mast, uh, and that's where we are to keep the boat at that constant angle of heel and hitting our target speed, then we need to have more brick. Um, and we try to, we, the brick is really based off of how much, how much runner we're, we're, we have on at any given moment in time. Um, but it's pretty obvious when you've, you know, when you've got too much runner. Um, but I do think in, you know, in 11, in 11 knots of breeze, you probably do need some bricks underneath just to, um, to, to keep your head stay engaged and then also to, uh, to not have your rig too loose. Yeah, perfect. I think that's really interesting that you say that. I think the head stay is really a big part of that tuning. And we'll dive into it a little bit later because it really, it really drives a lot of that jib trim, that, that the whole jib trim process. But I mean, it's pretty logical in the direction that you started because while the main seems like the important sail on the boat, really it comes down to, you know, trimming the jib correctly first because that's going to push, you know, as you talked about with the back one, that's going to push the main around and, and really try to, you know, that's, that's going to affect what you're doing with that jib and, and the jib trim itself really starts with that head stay and, and that, you know, the, the jib halyard as well. So if we were to just dive into detail on the jib halyard, you know, what are you looking for in the way of, in the way of sort of halyard tension for this 11 to 14 knot condition? Um, okay. So one of the, you know, one of the things we were talking a little bit about as we were prepping for this is, you know, in 11 to 14, 14 knots of breeze, it sounds like it's super easy to set the boat up or it's, it's super easy conditions to talk about. Um, I think it's a, a little bit of a, a discussion around, are you in uh, 11 knots of breeze and hunting for power? Cause you're, you're, the lulls are, 
you know, the, the lulls are, you, you're sailing more in eight than you are in 13, or are you in 11 knots of breeze and you're sailing more in 14 than you are in eight? Um, and that will impact a little bit how you set your jib up for sure and how you set your boat up overall. Um, but, you know, in general, um, it, say it's 11 and you're sailing a little more in 14 than in eight. Um, I don't really want, like I said before, any of those speed wrinkles in the front of the jib. Um, and we're watching for sort of a firmness of head stay and whether, you know, and again, this goes back to sort of the, the, the universals and the conditions. Um, if you've got relatively flat water and you're not hunting for power, well, you can have a fairly firm head stay overall. Um, and you can get there by runner or brick. Um, if it's 11 to 14 and you're, you know, it's lumpy and you are in a bit of hunt for power mode, you can get away with a little bit, a little bit of heads. You're looking for power. You probably want a little bit of head stay sag. I will say though, that it felt to me last summer, um, like, you know, you, you could, you got hurt by having too much head stay sag too quick, you know, relatively, relatively quickly. So in 12 knots of breeze, like, you know, I think there are better ways to power up the boat than to uh, put, put head stay sag in, in, in the rig. Or ease the jib halyard down as well. Correct. Is what you're, yeah. So, so what is that jib halyard really doing for you? And, and sort of what it's doing is it's, is it's closing the top of the sail. If uh, you know, if that makes sense, it's, it's basically, and Ben, correct me if you if I'm, you think I'm incorrect here. It's um, you know it, it's it's closing sort of that 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 upper leech section, and it's also obviously dragging the draft forward and flattening the sail out a little bit. But but really, it's making that vertical profile of the jib a lot straighter. And if we were to compare the two pictures here, where we have you know a, a, a much straighter, it's albeit a harder trim jib on the left here. Um, you know, and a, and, a, and a much more twisted profile between these two sails, you, you can see that the boat on the right is, is having wrinkles coming off of its, off of the jib hanks in the area, uh, you know, right along the luff of the sail. And those wrinkles are, are also helping to promote the fact that the top of their jib is, is quite a bit open. And I'll just do a little bit of annotation here on this and show what I'm looking at, which is that sort of the top of the jib here relative to the bottom of the jib is significantly more open. And yes, the sail is, is more trimmed away from the spreaders, but if we actually look at it in the, at the bottom spreader here, the actual sail itself between the two images isn't much more than an inch of difference between the two of them on those spreader marks. Maybe it's an inch and a half, two inches between the two marks on the spreaders but it really has this much more open at top and much more open in the bottom. And so what we're seeing is that top is promoting, having a loose jib hired is promoting a lot of top leech twist for a lot of return in the bottom, which probably as you get higher up the jib range, isn't as good as you want. You want to try to flatten out that bottom and that, and that comes in later as to why, but it's really trying to flatten out that bottom to, to reduce drag rack down there. Is that what you're thinking, Ben? Yeah, broadly, I think that's correct. Um, you know, interestingly enough, like one of the things that like both of these boats seem to have relatively consistent twist profiles between their main and their jib. So one thing I think they're both doing, whether, you know, and again, we're, you know, this is a photograph, so it's hard to, hard to say which boat's going better at this moment in time. Um, but it does look to me like both these, both these boats have achieved that thing that we talked about in the last webinar where you're trying to at least match your sails as much as possible. Right, exactly. And then something you mentioned early on was that 90% jib flowing on the upper leech telltale. And, you know, without having Hannah here to, to ask, I mean, the number of times you might have looked to lure it on your boat, do you think that this photo on the right, on the left here is, is potentially stalling a little bit more than 90%? And this one's potentially flying, you know, more like, more like 100%? Would that be from what you've seen of the jibs? If I had to guess, that's probably... That's probably right. Yeah. And so what's your goal then? Is your goal that 90%? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. So it's interesting, you know, and, and, and that 90% stall, obviously we'd like it to be stalling, you know, as much as you possibly can. Sort of the reason, you know, in a perfect world, it would be flying a hundred percent of the time. And if you trimmed it in a millimeter more, it would start to stall. But that 90% is really there because that's just giving us an idea of where 
the stall is actually happening. So we're going for that 90% because we can have it stall a little bit and we're still okay because we still have attached flow for you know most of the time across that sale. So yeah, it's like you know it's it's like when you're thinking about your target speeds, right? If your target's seven six, and uh, you can go seven six and point a little bit higher for that half second right before it crashes, you're, right? You're, you're gold, right? But like that's that's the that's the, you're you're just playing that edge, and it's the exact same with the main. You know that's like when I'm thinking about setting up the main, it's just finding that edge of uh, over trim, too much backstay, and then backing off from that to achieve our target speed. Exactly, exactly. And one thing while we have this picture here to look at is, you know, really what happens when we talk about that, talk about having a head stay, and we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later, and, and not having, when Ben, you were discussing head stay a lot earlier, what you're really looking at, it seems in the, you know, with the head stay sagging to leeward and falling out of the boat is actually really in the middle each and seeing it fall to leeward. Neither of these boats have it going on, but that seems to be the place where it's really going to be the jib trimmer that asks to ask to have a little bit more runner on. And, you know, and if you, if you don't want it for the main, then you'd probably go on a little bit on a couple fewer, a couple more bricks exactly. to be able to make it so that you, you control the head stay a little bit better with, with, uh, you know, the same amount of runner. Is that what you found? That's exactly, that's exactly right. And, um, you know, you had some pictures we looked at prior to this that, you know, where you can really see the middle of that jib, um, it goes pear-shaped very quickly. Uh, and that's something that, so when you think about the, the twist profile, having a relatively consistent twist profile from, you know, foot up to head is, is key, right? Like you don't want to have a wobble in the middle of the sail. Um, right. But I think you're, I think you're exactly right. And, you know, one of the things we were discussing in prep for this was, how do you know when you, when you've got to back off, when you've got to back off, um, when you've got to back off bricks, right? Because I think we all we've got an idea. Okay, well, we, we need more bricks, more bricks, more bricks. And I did get the sense last summer that there were teams that were um, all or none in terms of their approach to bricks. Well, the middle of the jib is one of the you know, probably two or three ways that you can you can figure out. Okay, we, we've got, um, you know, we we should be backing off, you know, five or seven mils of bricks. Yeah, I think, and, and one of those, when we had that discussion, right, one of the quick, the quick ways to look at it, if you look at the head, if you're sailing upwind and you look at the head stay and the head stays bouncing all around for the runner that you want, you probably need more bricks. And if the head stay is completely static for the amount of bricks that you want, then you probably want fewer bricks. And that, you know, that's, that's kind of probably one of those, you know, quick general, general rules of thumb that you might, that you might think about. Is that, have you found that as well? Yeah, I think the other way, like the other universal that we had was if we found ourselves in our, in a, again, one to nine in our runner range, if we found ourselves living more in the sort of, in these conditions, it, when, when we're talking about sort of the next 15 plus knots of breeze, that's a different different equation. But in these conditions, if you find yourself on your runner living more at the sort of seven to nine, the higher end of your range than the one to three, you're probably, you're probably over bricked at that point. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And so, you know, what we're, what's going on here is that so much of the whole rest of the boat setup actually does come down to the front of the jib and to the jib halyard and then to getting your jib leech correct. So once you sort of have your boat set up correctly in terms of, in terms of the jib with the luff and leech correct, the, the halyard and the, and the primary sheet correct, that's when I think we can step on to moving into looking at the, at the foot depth. And what were you using as a guide, Ben, for this condition for, for foot depth of the jib? Well, this is that's, that's Hannah right there. So that's good. Um, <laughs> uh, and you know, we spent, you know, I, like I said, she was a little more focused on this on, on a minute by minute basis than I was, but she was really going off the main and thinking about, you know, having, uh, having your leads in as tight as possible without affecting the main. Once you start to affect the main, that's when you need to start to, um, need to start to bring your, um, bring your, uh, bring your, you know, bring your leads a little bit further outboard. Um, you know, and it was essentially kind of one hole for every setting that we had in our bricks was her, was her kind of like universal, but obviously it, uh, it changed. Um, it changed from, uh, from, uh, kind of based on sea state, but that was kind of how, how we were thinking about where we wanted our, where we wanted our leads. 
Okay. Yeah. And that, and that makes, that makes sense a lot. And, and, you know, and actually how much backwind's going on. What about also the, you know, the foot depth of the jib, getting the third side of the jib, you know, of the, of the front triangle trim correctly. Now that we have the Luff and Leach, what were you guys looking for there in terms of the actual, you know, the depth that we can see in this photo here? Yeah. You know, I think it's, you know, there were a lot of boats that were sailing around with super strapped foots last year um, was kind of one of the things that I noticed. Um, and we found, um, to the extent you could put a little bit more depth into your, into your foot with that, um, you know, with, with the, with the up down control, um, we, we, we tried, we, we experimented a little bit with that, um, because it, you know, you really, you know, again, thinking about the, the, the overall twist, twist profile, um, you, you could lose the top of the jib real fast when you had, um, the super, the super strap foot. Yeah, and I think that makes sense as well when you think about the fact that the, that the jib foot is fairly well emplated across the deck of the boat. You know, in this in this case, obviously, with the spinnaker coming out of there, it's not perfect. But with it being that close to the deck and it being emplated as, as well as it is, you can sail around with a lot more camber um, in the in the bottom of the jib. You know, I think from a from a purely aerodynamic st uh, you know state, because if you had it up, you would want to make it as flat as possible to really to really stop that flow, you know, if you can, if you can reduce the difference of pressures between the sides of the sail, then you're going to have, uh, you know, less of a, of a, you know, yeah, smaller vortice going under the bottom of the sail. And so by making it flatter, you can reduce that, you know, that difference of pressures. Of course, if it's inflated, you don't have a way for that vortice to be created. So you can sail around with a deeper jib depth than you find and exactly what you're saying, you get power out of it, but it's also easy to really, get that upper leech of the jib in tight enough that 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 telltale is you know it is stalling 90 percent of the time but but i think the interesting thing that you said was actually earlier which had to do with the amount of backwind and you know would you could you would it be fair to say that you could achieve the same foot and twist in the jib and move the car in and out independent of that, Ben? Um, uh, Hannah's the better one to be able to, to answer that. I, I think you could. Um, just kind of thinking about thinking back, you know, digging deep into the memory bank, having not sailed the boat since October. But yeah, um, broadly speaking, I think, I think you could. I mean, uh, you know, because you also have your halyard as your, as a, you know, as a, uh, as, as, an, as a control that you can adjust in, you know, here as well, right? Like you can, you know, if you're, if you're struggling to get the right twist profile based on where you have your, your leads, you can, you can play with your halyard to get, to get the profile that you want. Yeah, exactly. And so really on that in out, you know, on the, on the, you know, not the up down, but the, but the transverse direction for that lead, you're really asking the jib trimmer, you know, as we see in this, in this next couple of shots here, you know, the difference you're asking the jib trimmer to really look at the main and try to make sure about how much it's the jib is actually backwinding into the main. And, Absolutely. you know, the, the photo on the left here is, you know, is, uh, is obviously it's about, you know, two feet into the back of the main. And, you know, the photo on the right is, is probably about a foot. And between the two of them, you can actually see in the photos that the cars are in fairly different places. So when you look at these two, then what do you, what do you think, as the main trimmer, what are you looking for in, in the amount of backwind and what are you hoping that Hannah's going to look at? Yeah. So, um, the photo on the left, uh, so, and it's a little bit, it's challenging too, because right. They've got a boat on their, on their hip and they may be, you know, they may be trying to shed that guy. There could, there are other things potentially happening, um, in that, and you don't know if they're, you know, a little pinchy or not, but it looks to me like, you know, they're, they're still on that all the way in maybe one hole out setting. Um, and the jib is, is pretty far into the main, um, dropping down one hole is going to allow you to keep your foot on the gas pedal. And remember, if we think about, you know, if we think about the main, the main is the driver of the boat, right? So the, you know, that's your, your main source of power. Um, and when you're all of a sudden using, you know, a third less of that sail because the jibs into it, you're just, you're going to struggle to, to go as fast. Um, so I would, it does, yeah, where you circled that there, it looks to me like it's probably all the way in, maybe one hole out. Um, and that may be a little bit, a little bit too strapped and too much into the, into the, into the main. 
So you're probably looking for about a foot? Uh, yeah, at, at most. I mean, I'm trying to keep the sale working as much as I can. You know, like it's like the, the rea I, I, I want that sale to be, you know, I, I'm fighting the sale to keep it, keep it flowing as much as absolutely possible at all times, particularly in 11 to 14 knots of breeze, right? I mean, you're not, you shouldn't be overpowered in these conditions, in these conditions at all. Um, and so uh, I would, you know, a foot maybe, but even, even then I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep the boat just charging along um, as, fa as fast as we can without, without being over on our ear. And I don't think you need, I don't think you should have that much backwind. Right. And, and you're looking for Hannah to look at that. Now, what about as a main trimmer, you know, in this, the next sort of place back is actually that, that if you were to follow in sequence here from the bow to the stern of the things that we're trimming as we go back in the boat, because that's how they affect, you know, the next thing back is really the Cunningham of the main. And if you crank on the Cunningham, you're dragging the draft forward in the main and you're, and you're really starting to, to, to add depth in the front part of the main. It, it it probably is uh, you know in this boat. It seems that it's logical once you bring in the main the Cunningham on pretty hard, which you do as you get further up the wind speed, that you're probably dropping your drib car down a little bit further. Were you guys seeing that happening? Yeah, no, we were we were actually fairly active with our Cunningham, um, or or sorry, active is not the right. We were uh, aggressive in pulling Cunningham on relatively quickly. Um, you know, as you know, once you got into, into these conditions, we certainly had Cunningham on and 11 knots of breeze. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really easy then to see, you know, that, that sort of little bit of backwind in the main to know that you're, you're, you know, or a lot to know that it's, know that it's too tight. How about, how about when it was too far out and the breeze had died a little bit? What were you guys using as a tell for that? That, again, to me, that's where you are in your runner. You know, if all of a sudden you're, you're living a lot more in the the light, the sort of the, the light runner settings, um, and you're struggling to hit that seven five seven six knots of speed at your optimal angle of heel without reaching off the race course. Um, you know, I think I think you're using other tells than uh, maybe the sail. I think you're using the other controls and, and where you are on, you know, and, and, and getting to that that that. Um, getting to that, that target speed. Yeah, definitely. I, I would agree with that. I think, you know, I think for sure. And, and also if you're, if you're out on the car and you're never, ever, ever seeing any backwind in the back of the main, even in the very luff of it, and you've got everything off and the runner's starting to come off, then that's probably another good, a good tell to tell you that it's time to, that it's time to bring that, bring that car up a little bit higher. The, the other way you can probably get, if you're starting to bring your traveler up to get point, then mm -hmm. you're probably a little bit too, you, you can probably bring your jib car in one, one hole. Okay. That makes sense. So you're basically, what you're doing is you're turning both of those, you're turning both of the, the, the trim tabs, you know, the, the sort of, you know, because each of them are affecting each other, you're turning the trim tabs a little bit closer to center line and, and, and you want to turn them both at the, at the same angle. So you're bringing it in it. Exactly. It makes sense from aerodynamics. So as we step backwards here in the boat, we probably we end up, you know, with the main. And let me go ahead and clear that annotation that we've got going there. But, you know, we end up with, with really how you're trimming the main because so much of that is affected by, you know, where the jib is. But where the jib is, you know, it's this, it's this feedback loop. It's this loop of where the jib is to where the main's being trimmed and, and from where the main's being trimmed to to where the jib is back again. So, you know, from looking at those, you know, from looking at different setups and from your experience in this, in this 11 to 14 condition, you're probably going to be, you know, just getting into the runner and looking to get, you know, get the boat rolling forward because you're all already all the way powered up. So, you know, what is, what are you doing as a main trimmer to determine how much runner you want, how much twist you want in the main and, and, and what you're looking for here? Yeah. So again, if we, if we assume, so, you know, for better or worse in these conditions, my head is in the boat the entire time. Right. And I'm focused on angle of heel focused on um, hitting that target speed, constantly talking to, uh, you know, Jay driving and the runner trimmer, um, to determine, you know, where we, where we are in the runner and where we want to be based on how much sheet tension I have on. So um, if you 
you know, I'm broadly looking for, again, a fairly consistent twist profile, maybe a little bit less twist than we had um, in the last conditions. And, and, and we'll talk about, you know, having a lot more twist in sort of the breezier conditions, um, but a fairly consistent twist profile with, uh, uh, with the top tail tail flowing roughly 90% of the time. Um, again, if we're in fairly consistent, I'm assuming we're sailing in, you know, more, more puffs than lulls. And so I'm not looking for power. Um, you know, I, I look at the boat and the, the boat on the left, you know, we talked about Cunningham before feels to me like maybe they're either a little light on their halyard or, um, or, or maybe a little light on their Cunningham. Um, but I'm, I'm looking to not over bend the main with the, with the backstay. I'm looking for, again, like I said, constant angle of heel um in that call it 19 to 22 degree range um and then it's uh, in out in out in out all day long on the main sheet uh to to achieve those those two things and if i find that the range that i'm playing on the main needs to increase or decrease then i need to make a gross adjustment on the runner and if i'm all of a sudden finding that you know i need to ease the sail more to keep the boat underneath us and, and scorting forward in the puff then that's when we're going up a setting on the runner or maybe two settings on the runner or conversely, if all of a sudden I'm, you know, I'm having to drag the traveler up um, and ease a sail a little bit uh, to, to keep our, you know, to keep, to keep the boat rumbling. That's when we probably need to ease a little bit, ease a little bit off the runner. And these boats definitely tell you when you have too much runner on, um, it's very, very, very obvious, you know, in terms of the, the, the sales, uh, the sales give you that, that feedback loop very quickly. Yeah, so I think it's interesting. We can actually see it here between sale 22 uh, and, and sale, no, sale number 29 here. You know, if we look in the same area, we've got those overbend wrinkles just starting on, on sale number 22, and, and you can just see the, them, them starting a little bit. So that's, you know, in this range, you're probably, you're probably just getting to the top of the runner, you know, a couple of times here and there, you're probably just getting to the top of overbend. And, and that's really what you're looking for is those overbend wrinkles through the sail. And, you know, you obviously overbend wrinkles themselves are potentially not the fastest way to sail the boat, right? It's, it's because the overbend wrinkles are just tension from that point in the mass to the clue, which is making the main act as, as two different, two different flaps. And you sort of, you sort of lose control of the of the upper leech because when you trim the main on, you really can't get can't get any tension in it. So you're you're kind of looking for those overbend wrinkles to be probably you know just starting to show up, and if they do show up, maybe you use a little runner back off and and you know let the sail let the leech engage a little bit more, so you're not just reaching around the race course, right? Absolutely, that's that's exactly right. One of the things you had said when we were prepping for this was you were talking about the fact that, you know, or, or Phil had actually said it was, he was talking about the fact that he, he felt that when you were on too much runner, it was actually sort of a crutch. It was a, it was a way to make the main trim more automatic for the breeze that was, you know, that you were in. And, you know, and, and, and by, by overbending that, when the puff hit, the main would open up itself. And, you know, the ramification of that is, of course, that that the VMG is suffering. The boat might be going really fast around the race course, but it's not really going upwind. Was this something you guys were finding as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you, the, the shape of, of the, that, you know, the main opens up at the top very, very easily and very nicely, right? And so, um, you know, you can flatten out the bottom section, all of a sudden twist off the top and be losing the top um, real, very easily. And so, yeah, the puff will hit and you feel like you're squirting forward, but you're not necessarily sailing upwind when, when that happens. And you've got, you know, a quarter of your sail that's not, not doing anything for you. And again, these are conditions where, you know, you, you're not, you shouldn't be crazy overpowered. So you can see that puff coming and um, adjust for it ahead of time. If you've already got so much runner on that, you know, you're, you're, at, the, you're at the bottom of that sail control, um, you know, and the puff hits, uh, you know, you have to be, you have to be fairly active on your main sheet. So I do think, I think Phil's exactly right. It can be a crutch. Um, I think you, you know, this is one of the places where, you know, your, your main sheet trimmer earns their money in these conditions, particularly if it's puffy, you know, it's a constant, you know, it's a constant in out and you're playing probably a wider range of sheet than you might think. But I'd also say, if you see, if you look at the, the picture on the right, looks to me like the boat's about to sail into a breeze line um, that, maybe sort of deep, you know, it's not just a, it's not just sort of the, the five second puff, it's coming to a breeze line. That's where I'm thinking about, 
talking to our runner trimmer, okay, as we're sailing into this, I'm going to need to go up a setting or two um, on the runner so that I can then, you know, I'm not just going to solve that with a, a micro main sheet um, solution. It's not just going to be the five second or three second um, main sheet adjustment. That's something that's going to be different. That's a, that's a macro, it's a macro adjustment. Yeah, and that's interesting that you say that. So you're, you're really using, you know, we're doing a similar thing. You're using, using the runner to flatten the global shape of the main to allow the boat, you know, when it doesn't need the power anymore, the depth from the power, you want to reduce drag. So you're putting the runner on to flatten the global shape of the main to allow the boat to go faster. And, you know, I know for a lot of the time sailing on the boat, it's, it's pretty easy to get the boat up to 6.8, six, 6.9, six, you know, something like that in terms of knots. But really that, that last sort of 0.6 knots to get to the, you know, to the, to the, six, the 7.6 and the 7.5s boat speed range really comes from flattening out the main and reducing drag. Were you guys finding that? Absolutely. And, and going back to where we started, it, it firms up your head stay at the exact same time. Uh, right. So you're, you're in a much, you know, the, the trim of the boat is much more appropriate for, you know, for that puff that's going to be more sustained. Uh, so... In these two drawings that you see here, you've got fairly different upper leech twists between the two different boats. And, and what are you seeing? You know, what, what, are you, what are you looking for when you're working on your upper leech? You know, for, for, for what we've seen, it seems to be it's a balance thing from the driver. Is that what you guys are seeing as well? Yeah, it's, you know, it, again, um, you know, if you go back to the conversation between me and Jay uh, driving the boat, it's how much helm does he have? Um, where is that edge of having, you know, an appropriate amount of helm versus, um, versus too much or being too neutral? Because you can neutralize the helm in these boats very easily, I think. Um, uh, are we, you know, and this is where, you know, the, the boat setup on the way out is really important or, you know, the tuning for the 45 minutes or hour beforehand is really important. Are we sailing upwind, hitting our targets at the right heel angle? Um, and do we have a gauge as to how we're doing versus, versus other boats? Um, you know, if you're sailing around in, in a vacuum, you know, we, we were, you know, it's, I think it's real easy. You know, you, you, you go off the starting line, you're hitting your, you're hitting your, your targets. Um, and you look up, you know, you get to the corner, you look up and you've reached off the side of the race course. Uh, you've got to be able to actually keep the boat, you know, moving up wind. It's really that VMG. And so, um, Again, like I said, the, I don't necessarily know whether the, the boat in the middle is set up better or the boat in the right set up better. If I had to guess, I'd probably be looking to set my main up a little bit more like the boat in the right than the boat in the middle. Um, at least that's just kind of, I also like to sail with a slightly twistier profile in my sails. That's a, maybe that's going back to my Etchell's days. Um, but uh, I'm guessing, you know, just looking at the photo, the boat in the, on the right is probably slightly trab up. Um, you can also see they haven't yet started to bring anybody back um, in fore aft weight placement. Um, it looks to me like the boat in the, in, the, in the middle maybe has one body back at that point, um, and they're not sailing, you know, they're sailing the boat awfully flat um, relative to uh, sort of maybe what I would think would be the optimal heel angle. Um, but the boat in the right is also set up, I think, pretty well for, for puffs, right? Like, you know, when the puff hits, um, they've got they've got tools in their toolbox to keep the boat moving. Um, you know, when, when the breeze goes from 11 to 14 knots, right? Like they can drop their traveler down a little bit. They've, they've probably got back stay to play with based on the fact that they're not over bent at this point. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's the other thing that I, I tend to think about as well is, you know, what are we going to do when things change and do we have the tools to make the boat go fast when things change? So you're using that, that slightly, go ahead, Greg. Oh, no, I, well, I don't want to interrupt, but I just was thinking when you guys are talking modes here, and I'm just thinking back when you're talking about the upper leech of the jib telltale flowing 90% of the time, and you're talking about changing the main shape, and maybe this isn't the time you guys want to address it, but I'm thinking about if there's a time you want to peel somebody off your hip and you want to stick it, is that something that you can do readily? And, or if there's somebody right to lure it over you that you want to get over the top of, would these kind of discussions that you're having been with the, the twist, the traveler position and the balance lead to your ability to go high or go low? Or, or is that something that's really 
challenging to do here in these boats? No, it's definitely, uh, we're, we're, we're constantly thinking about that. You know, there are times where you're going to have to do something longer, you know, to live in a place than, than you really want to. So you're going to have to make your sales, you know, work as long as possible. Um, and there are going to be times where you do need to shed somebody on your hip or you do want to roll over somebody to lure to view. Um, and you can, yeah, I think this should, this, you know, Mike did a good job of building sales that are malleable enough to, to, to allow the boat to do, to, to, to mode like that for, for sure. It was interesting when you guys were talking about in our prep time, you indicated if you wanted to put the bow down and rumble, you wouldn't necessarily ease the jib much because you'd lose too much of it. Right. Is that a. Yeah, for sure. And that's actually something I didn't, I wasn't, you know, when I was looking at these photos, I was, I was mostly focused on the main. Mm -hmm. I do think that the, the main and the jib are not matched in that right photo um, particularly, particularly well. They've got a, a very twisty setup in their main and it's hard to tell in the jib, but it doesn't, doesn't look to me. It looks like a fairly firm leech um, top to bottom. Um, uh, yeah. But yeah, no, and Greg, that's something but to keep in mind too, when you're talking about boating like that, you know, that's a conversation that we're having between the runner trimmer, the main trimmer, the jib trimmer, the driver, and the tactician, right? Like that's something that we're all talking about. And it's not like, okay, I'm just going to change the main and we're going to do something dramatically different. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, may, we, we may change the jib a little bit. Um, it won't necessarily be as big a change as we'll have in the main, but we have to change the runner. Otherwise, we're going to end up with a real funky sail shape. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I think it's interesting you say that, and and sort of what we what we had found in the boats um, from sailing them early on was that there really wasn't a lot of the moding you could do with the driving. To touch on that question, Greg, a lot of it really came from you'd kind of keep the jib telltales the same because stalling the jib with the windward telltale dancing, or stalling the jib with the leeward telltale dancing is, you know, the leeward one gives you a bigger uh, a bigger groove to 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 for have it stalled and and uh and keep the boat going but but both of them aren't fast neither of them are actually doing what you're trying to do they aren't the optimum for what you're looking for you're kind of looking for that windward one to be just stalling and maybe maybe the you know maybe the front of the jib isn't the, you know for sure the front of the jib isn't backing yet but uh you know but i think that a lot of it isn't coming from the driving it's probably coming more from you know just how you mode the sails as ben is talking about it's maybe you know, if you want that height, maybe you go for a little bit of traveler off, a little bit of runner off, and you just round up the main and engage the upper leech of it a little bit more, or you trim the main a little bit harder and don't change the runner and just engage the upper leech a little bit more to get a bit of height out of it or the opposite for the, you know, for the fast forward mode. Is that something that you were seeing as well then? Yeah, it, would, it was more, tra it was trav up was the move that we were using to, when we needed to get height. Um, uh, trav up and runner off or that was generally the, that was generally the move. Um, but yeah, like, you know, what, whatever you want to do to, to engage the top leech domain is exactly, is exactly right. I mean, you're, you're just, it, there are different ways, different ways you can, you can do that. And also depending upon how big of a, you know, how, 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 how large of a, a change you need to make, right? You know, are you on the starboard tack ley line or the port tack ley line and you need to hang off of somebody's hip and you know, you're going to have to make this work for, for two minutes. Um, and you're just going to have to be really, 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 really active for those two minutes, because this is like, you know, this is the, the place you find yourself. Um, or, you know, you're, you know, you're getting, you know, you're, you're off, you're off the starting line and you want to get to the right side, but you've got somebody on your hip. How do you shed that person the quickest? Um, you know, the, so there are different answers, I guess, is the, uh, is, is, is what, what my point is, um, and different levels of activity that you have to have with the sail shapes. But, it, it was very rare that I was turning to Jay saying, okay, drive two or three degrees higher now. That, that, wasn't the, that wasn't the move. You know, you create lift in these boats often, you know, all the time, you know, with, with, with boat speed. So um, right. that's something you, you've always got to remember. So to, right, exactly. And you said something interesting. I'm sorry to interrupt that. I, I've heard you say a couple of times how active you were with the main sheet. In some of our prep, I was surprised that, what active means. And I think that was pretty cool to describe, you know, just how much you are playing the main on this boat. Sure. So, um, you know, we'll probably talk a lot more about that in the next, in the next webinar when it's, you know, we're talking about 18 knots of breeze and, and I feel like my arm's going to fall off at the end of the day. Um, but, you know, broadly speaking in, in, in these conditions, let's say we're our targets, I don't know, seven, four, seven, five. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, I, 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 my, I don't really 
I'm not looking around the race course, unfortunately, uh, as much as I, I wish I could be. Um, my eyes are really trained between the top of the leech of uh, the main and, um, you know, our compass and our, our speedo. Uh, and then down at the, at the, at the main sheet, and I'm just kind of cycling through the three of those, mostly between um, the leech and, and, the, and the, the speedo. And if our target says seven, four, seven, five, and all of a sudden we're going, um, you know, we're going seven, 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 eight, and I know the next move is seven, nine, well, we're probably not sailing up wind. And so it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a turn in on the main and, and a, and a comment to Jay, okay, Jay, you're going seven, eight here. Let's, let's burn just a little bit of this. Um, and the turn in with the main is going to allow him to, you know, very, very ever so slightly, you know, point the boat a little bit higher and burn that back down. But I also know it's going to crash quickly. So, you know, we go from seven, eight to seven, six, I can't let the boat go to seven, three. So that's the ease back out in the main and you're, it's a constant up, down, up, down. Um, in these conditions, it's, you know, I'm playing, you know, a couple of inches, three inches in the main, the next setting up, it's, it's a lot more. Um, but it's, it's a constant in, out, in, out. And then when I feel like, um, like I said before, if I'm, uh, if I'm, if I'm reaching um, the end of the sheet too quickly and we've got to make a runner adjustment, that's, we, 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 we go there. But it's, I'm using, I'm using the, the main sheet uh, and where we are in our relative to our target um, constantly and talking to Jay, okay, Jay, you're a little bit slow here. You know, here's a, you know, I've, I've, you've got the inch and a half of ease in your sheet. Let's get the book back up to seven, five, but I don't want it to overshoot it again. Just like I said before, we're going too too fast. You know, if we're going seven, seven, two, seven, three, and I want to get a seven, five, I don't want to overshoot and get to seven, seven. It's the, it's the volatility around that target speed that I'm trying to keep as, as, as minimal as possible and doing that with sheet tension. So it's, it's really interesting that you say that because that's really driving home this idea that, that the main leech is really the balance of the boat is so much from that upper main leech, right? I mean, that's really what you're going for here is that, you know, if you want to increase the helm a little bit and get Jay to drive a little bit higher, you trim the main in just a couple more, you know, an inch or two. And, or if you want to re you release the helm and let the boat go forward, you're, you're easing the main out an inch or two. And so that active main is really important. The other, the other thing that I think is really important about that is if you have too little runner on, you'll, you find, and, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, you'll find that you're going through six or eight inches of main, even nine, 10 inches of main, because when the puff hits, you really, each of the main engages and the boat gets quickly overpowered and then it goes quickly underpowered when the puff goes away. And so, you know, that's just another way of knowing needing to get more, more runner on. Is that something that you've seen, Ben? I, I think that's, that's absolutely right. It's, you know, and, and some of it is you're, you're anticipating the puff too, right? So, you know, in that picture on the right where you, you know, there's a puff that's, you know, a few boat lengths away, the conversation between me and the runner trimmer so that we don't, we don't tip over, we don't start to go sideways um, is happening so that we're, you know, we're leading into the puff um, with, with our trim. But no, that, I think you said it very eloquently. It's, it's really all about the upper, upper leech of, of, of the main and how you're, you're thinking about it. It also goes back to the point that I was making earlier. You need to know where the edge is, that you're on that edge of, <coughs> excuse me, the right, the right amount of main sheet trim and the right amount of runner at all times um, so that you're not, you know, the wing is not constantly moving around more than it really needs to. I mean, these conditions, you want a fairly stable, fairly stable silent boat. Right, right. So then we sort of have three other controls on the main once we, you know, once we have that upper leech really set in, we've got Cunningham bang and outhaul. And, you know, in this condition, what are you looking for for the Cunningham? You know, we can see it a little bit in fills. I'd say you're looking to get most of the wrinkles out, but not all of the wrinkles out. You know, maybe maybe 50 to 70% of the wrinkles out with the Cunningham in this? Yeah. So it's a... Go ahead. I'd say, I'd say that's about right. Um, yeah, I, I would, you know, and everybody's, everybody's up on the rail. I don't think you really are looking for, you know, you don't, you don't need wrinkles here. But I also don't think you want to pull in so much Cunningham that you're depowering the main. You know, you're trying right. to find that edge. Um, you know, you, you don't, you don't, you're not yet to the point where you're, uh, you're overpowered an awful lot in these conditions, right? So I don't think you're looking to move the draft of the sail with your coming in. Right. And then, and then in terms of Vang in these conditions, you know, I definitely find that when we were, you know, in the way the sails are designed, the Vang is really there 
it really affects the bottom stripe of the mane uh, massively uh, in terms of depth and just, just balancing the vertical profile of the mane a little bit. So what, where would you be setting the bang for this condition? Yeah, so again, in these conditions we are, um, and I'll be honest, we had, we had everything, we had, we had all sorts of pretty, pretty marks and we would talk about sort of where we were in the marks. Um, I was not yet looking to vang sheet. We did aggressively vang sheet when it got windy. Um, but it was really essentially just as more of a stabilizer and making sure that that vertical profile, um, again, we're not depowering the sail with the vang yet. It's more of a stabilizing influence at this point. Yeah, and one of those things that you might see and, and potentially something we saw earlier on that boat with, with a lot of backwind in the bottom of the main, their vang was also very loose on the deck of the boat. So that might be something very quickly to, you know, just a little touch on the bang is going to flatten out the very front edge of that stripe and, and, and help to, you know, and help to, to thin out that entry so the jib isn't backing into it as much. It, it does have a very big impact. I mean, the bang is a very powerful, very powerful tool in these boats. I, I think you're, you are exactly right there. And I think it's very easy to overdo it in these conditions as well, right? I mean, I think it's very easy to end up overvanged. Um, and then quite frankly, it sets up, you know, your, your, your back stands up in the wrong place very quickly too. So I think it's, right. it's finding, it's finding, you know, quite frankly, probably taking a, a bit of, you know, taking the tension out of it, pulling it on just a little bit more, taking a look up the sail to see if all of a sudden you're, you are depowering your sail with the, with that. And then, and then easing that back off to just, to just, uh, to just snug. And, and we touched on a little bit before in terms of the outhaul and, and, and really, you know, we, we had said you kind of want the outhaul to be pretty snug in this and and the same thing you know and correct me if if you think i'm if you think i'm wrong here but it's it really comes down to that end plating effect right having the outhaul snug is you know flattening the bottom of the main is is decreasing the the difference in pressures from each side of the sail so that's decreasing the 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 differential between them two, between the two of them and therefore the 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 likelihood of not the likelihood of it because there's always going to be a vortice there but but you know the the actual amount of it because the main is an end plated so in this condition you really are really putting that outhaul not not you know bone tight but i think you said it in our discussions before it was you know just easing it enough so it was it, it's not you know strapped wrinkled but it's but it's it's definitely on it's you know is that kind of yeah. what you were seeing yeah no that's, that's that's exactly right it was a uh, you know um, not a lot of boats go fast with really, really loose outhauls. And this is a, this is, IC37 is not one of those boats for sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's funny, so many boats we sail, we always sail around with the outhaul on tight. But but we've basically, now that we've kind of gotten through the, uh, you know, gotten through the, the sail setup, you know, overall generally in these boats you're looking for this this constant angle of heel right and and so in this conditions if you remember back where we started here where our, our focus really was on making sure the sails were set up correctly because that's where your speed is going to come from in these conditions the you know and, and the boat has a constant angle of heel but all the crew is is already out hiking and 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 they're already out you know out there and and going sailing so you know, what are you looking for? You know, you talked about the four F a little bit. Um, you know, we, we talked about a lot in our discussions. What are you looking for in this four F of the crew? And we see it a little bit in this top down shot. You know, what do you, what are you looking for, for, for that, for that group? So, um, and I, I connected briefly with our bow guy, Brian Fox, cause he's the one who's really gauging, um, how much our knuckles digging in, um, in these kinds of conditions, but you know, it's a, the, it's, the boat's got a fairly wide transom. We don't want to drag that around um, at all. In fact, you know, when we, if you transition, initially if you transition from that like underpowered people to lured, um, then to moving up on the rail, um, we actually tend to start all else equal with one or two people in front of the, in front of the shrouds. Um, Cause we really are, are, are worried about dragging the transom, dragging the transom around. So it's not at all uncommon for us to have one or two people in front of the shrouds that at least in the initial powered up move, <coughs> excuse me. And then as we're sailing around, um, it is about how much we're digging the bow then, um, you know, as, as the boat gets, as the boat gets powered up. Um, and, you know, it's Brian Fox, he's, he's looking at, you know, how much we're digging, um, digging the bow in, not, you know, let's assume fairly flat water, not just in waves, but, um, you know, we uh, we're generally trying to not dig 
the knuckle of the boat in a whole heck of a lot. Um, you know, in the club bone boats, we have a, a bow, we have a, a bootstripe, which helps as a, as a fixed gauge for that. You're not kind of guessing, you can broadly tell off of that. Um, you know, Foxy told me his, uh, you know, his gauge is, are we digging the bow in, you know, half of, you know, halfway or more? Uh, but he seemed to find that, you know, we could, we were digging the bow in relatively quickly in these boats. So while we'd start out, get everybody up on the rail, um, you know, in 11 to 14, it wasn't uncommon for us to have one person back, um, you know, particularly as you got to 14, one person back, uh, back behind the skipper. So it was really interesting what you said there. So he's looking at the bow and, and we actually got Mark Mills on the line on one of our calls here and, uh, and, and asked him what he was thinking. And, you know, really as the boat heels over, it's a wedge, right? So, so when it heels over, it tries to drive the bow in because in reality, a heeled boat, I'm just gonna get my little line tool here, a heeled boat actually has the center line of, of where everyone is hiking against actually goes from, you know, from the bow to the, to the corner. So it's really trying to drive the bow in. So you get a lot of writing moment from, from everyone being back. But, and, and his comment was that, you know, in, in the modeling, it would say that, that you would want to move back as soon as you're up to power because you get that increased writing moment, that distance between that center line to the edge. But, you know, in the way we, in the way the boats have been being sailed, everyone's been a little bit further forward, and it seems to be better. And and his comment had to do with how the wake was exiting the back of the boat, and he was he was looking for about eight to ten inches of separation between that between that wake in the back of the boat and you know and 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 the stern, because he was saying that at that point you know that you've got clean wake, and you know, and the boat's actually the boat's not just dragging the dragging the stern around. Would you agree with that as well? Yeah, listen, I think you can, you can kind of tell in the extreme with how much you're hobby horsing, right? Like that's something, you know, and probably in 11 knots of breeze, you're not hobby horsing a whole heck of a lot, but in 14, you might be hobby horsing a bit more. I think that's, I think is, you know, I think he's probably right. I also am not convinced that anybody's figured out the right, the optimal weight placement and when we should all be moving around. That's something that I think, um, I think we, we all can probably be working more on as, as, as we progress with these boats. Yeah, interesting. I, I definitely, I definitely agree with that. So, oop, I went the wrong way here on the uh, on the slides. But, uh, but just, uh, just to you know, as a, as a final setup here, you know, what we're really seeing in this condition is is it seems if we had to boil it down to the three major goals, we're really seeing, you know, our goal is kind of to have the boat do that 7.6 knots with that 19 to 22 degrees of heel or 18 to 22 degrees of heel. And, and our focus has shifted from the light, you know, from the light air, it shifted, you know, being less on where the crew weight is and what the crew is doing. And now it's more on, you know, what, you know, just the crew is all out hiking. Maybe their fore and aft is changing a little bit, but it's not constantly changing. It's not changing puff by puff. It's, uh, you know, it's, it, the, the crew weight is pretty static and, and our real focus has now shifted to the, you know, making sure the sails are right, making sure that the boat is, you know, is, is sailing well upwind and, you know, and, and actually achieving that speed. Is that, is that pretty accurate from what you've seen for this condition? Yeah. And, and like I said before, it's, it's really having as little vol around that target speed as possible, right? And how do you keep about trucking upwind at that target and not, you know, not healing over too much or, or being too flat um, and a relatively quiet boat. I mean, these are conditions where, you know, things are, are fairly calm. You know, I think we, we may be in slightly different places on how much, uh, how much back when we want in the main in these conditions, I would err on a little bit less and, um, than you maybe, but like broadly speaking, you're just, you're really just focused on um, hitting, hitting that target uh, with, a, with, a, with as stable a boat as, as possible. Yeah, exactly. Getting that target, getting the the helm balance to be able to get to that target, and and flattening out the sails to you know again to get to that target with that with that stable boat from the crew weight. Very interesting. So it's it's definitely different than uh, than that light air. What do you think, Greg? I think we're good. I think you guys certainly presented a bunch of great stuff, and you know we'll certainly create a lot of good questions and. Uh, you know, if you all have questions that come up after this is over, there's the email address to send them to. And certainly the three of us will get back to you with an answer as soon as we can. And, um, and we certainly hope you'll join us for the webinar number five, as the guys have been talking about the overpowered upwind trim on the 23rd. 
And uh, Ben and Mike, thanks so much for taking of your time to make this happen. And um, I know I sure learn a ton from you guys every time we do this. So thanks a lot. And, um, and Laura, thanks for uh, running this for us and making it happen. And uh, we hope to see you all next time. Great. Thanks very much, Greg. And thanks, Ben. Thanks, thanks you guys. Take care.